This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of March 17th, 2024. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 334 and happy St. Patrick's Day. Benachti, nafila, parut och. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And on the Big Deal feature. To celebrate St. Patrick's Day, my guest is Kerry Mortimer, the chair of Gaelic Games Canada, the governing body across Canada for Ireland's national sports, hurling, and Gaelic football. On St. Patrick's Day 2024, we'll take a moment to look back 39 years ago to the 1985 Shamrock Summit in Quebec City. Canada's Prime Minister Brian Mulroney hosted U.S. President Ronald Reagan for the St. Patrick's Day Summit. They celebrated U.S. and Canada friendship and Irish culture. Reagan was just starting his second term in the White House. Mulroney was in his first year at 24 Sussex. Mulroney died February 29th, and his state funeral is coming March 23rd. Here are the sounds of the summit, including Mulroney at the microphone, courtesy of the Reagan Library. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. They are truly worthy All-Ireland champions. Ball comes down into the corner again. Peter Casey, four points, going for his fifth on the turn. The reaction from the crowd says it all. He's having a game and a half, like so many of these Limerick beautiful hurlers that are playing for their county in the green and white. You have to applaud them with this sort of a display. Yeah, but Conor Boylan again, you know, it comes on, the, the players come on, Cahill and Conor Boylan, they fit straight into the system without Sean Finn, without the great captain Declan Hannum, two great players, you know, just get on with it, get on with it, and put on a second half display. They've scored 20 points now in the second half, as good a display in the second half you've ever seen in Ireland final. Those were sounds of the 2023 All-Ireland Hurling Final at Dublin's Croke Park, where Limerick defeated Kilkenny, courtesy of GAA and RTE 2's Sunday game. This is a special March 17th St. Patrick's Day edition of the podcast, and it's no better time to look at hurling and Gaelic football in Canada. The national sports of Ireland are played worldwide and across Canada in Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and B.C., my guest is Kerry Mortimer, the chair of the county board, Gillick Games Canada. When Ottawa-based Mortimer isn't running her Mortimer Marketing Group agency in the national capital, she's overseeing the games in Canada. First of all, paint the picture of what these sports are like in Canada, what the footprint is like in Canada for these sports. Yeah, I certainly can. Thanks for for having me on the show. Um, yeah, so Canada GA is like is the national um, governing body for Gaelic sports in Canada, and uh, we have thirty one clubs across Canada. 
getting close to about 3,000 members now uh, from Vancouver in the West um, out to Halifax, uh, sorry, Vancouver Island in the West. Uh, we have Van, uh, Van Al Rovers in, in Victoria um, out to Halifax and uh, kind of across the country that way. And yeah, we have, have the, they are the Indigenous Sports of Ireland. Um, Hurling and camogie. Um, hurling is the uh, sport the males play, and uh, female it's called camogie. But it's some rules are slightly different, but essentially it's it's the um, it's the same sport. You have a hurl in your hand and uh, a ball, sort of the size of a baseball, and um, <clears throat> and then for Gaelic football, it's a uh, a Gaelic football is similar in size to a soccer ball. Kind of looks it's all white, looks a little bit like a volleyball, but. Uh, yeah, and, and the games are played uh, 15 aside and uh, really, you know, just great sports to uh, to try. You actually started playing Gaelic football at age 29, according to your bio. Mm -hmm. uh, you played soccer for many years, but uh, what drew you to Gaelic football? Yeah, I, I I really I grew up playing every sport. I just love every sport. Soccer ended up being my main sport and and played that quite com competitively uh, over the years. And I moved to Ottawa and uh, I did, only knew my husband there, so I needed some friends and I wanted to play sports. So I joined a soccer team, of course. And then uh, on my team there was uh, an Irish girl, and she my maiden name is Macaulay, so Carrie Macaulay. She said you must be Irish with that name. So I said, oh yeah, I am. And she goes, oh, you have to try Gaelic football. So oh, all right, I'll try it, <laughs> and uh, that was it for me. I it's I love the sport. It you know after playing a competitive sport, I, I didn't you know didn't want to you know continue playing or could actually at that point continue playing at that competitive level of soccer. So it was a great challenge, uh, very transferable skills, um, and just it's just a great sport. And you sort of start for the sport and 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 get drawn in for the sport, but. For me, I'm 25 years in now, and and really, you stay for the community. Um, and it was, it's, for me, it's a connection to my Irish culture. My parents are from Ireland, um, and I moved to Canada, you know, at the age of five. Um, and so, it, for me, it connects me to that as well. And and all my cousins and aunts and uncles still live in Ireland, so it's a great cultural connection. But anywhere you go, and you'll hear that from from Irish people that travel around the world. You know, often their their first stop when they when they move somewhere is to call the the local GAA club and because it gives you you know opportunity to play your sport but it gives you a community you find friends and can find a job can find a place to live and it's just a great soft landing if you're moving anywhere in the world and there's over there's 400 and well pushing 475 clubs international clubs around the world now so it's uh you can you can always find a home wherever you go and you mentioned the transferable skills. Uh, Gaelic football, of course, has elements of soccer, some elements of rugby. Uh, yeah, even with the bouncing of the ball, uh, someone who played basketball could find yeah. uh, a way to transfer those skills. It predates most sports. Uh, you know, the, the Gaelic games, hurling and Gaelic football go back a long time before the sports that are popular today around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hurling, I, I think, you know, dates back to, ooh, I think it's maybe... 12th century or something like that but um yeah these are these are you know the, like i said the indigenous sports of ireland and they've you know sort of evolved and changed over the years all sports over the years as all sports do um but yeah they really are uh you know gaelic football is an example you know high catches so yes a basketball player you're when you hand pass it it's sort of like an underhand volleyball pass so a volleyball player you know would be great and and those big jumps to get up and 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 catch the ball out of the air uh kicking you know out of your hand so the soccer there um <clears throat> and then when it, we go over to hurling and camogie um you know it's it's great especially and can be quite popular with canadians because of our love of stick sports so hockey ice hockey actually has its origins in hurling um out in nova scotia there's a great documentary that that sort of um, tracks the history of ice hockey and really it was ice hurling being played out in Nova Scotia um, back in the early 1800s and that kind of has evolved from there so hockey ringette for girls is a, another stick sport broom ball um, baseball uh, you know all of these sports that you know it's a stick and ball sport so um, people that try it you can get quite good at from transferring from other other sports that you've played. Uh, there's the All Ireland Final every uh, year for uh, for the sports, and that's played at Croke Park. Now you've had a chance to actually attend the finals there. Well, I, I've gone on a tour there when it's been empty, but uh, what's it like when it's full and when the trophy is on the line? Yeah, it's an incredible atmosphere there, and um, it seats 
about 80,000 people and it is you know in in the yearly calendar it is it is marked as as uh you know the the place to be and and there's uh to get tickets is really difficult and so you want to get in to try and see if you can get tickets it all comes through your club and and you have to uh it's a very unique way how you can even get tickets and and everything in in um the Gaelic games family um sort of starts with the club so it's 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 the club and and in Ireland it was sort of based regionally on the parish and where you live and that's the club you're you're born into and you are a member of um you know for uh, your life and the life of, you know, your, your kids down the line. And uh, yeah, so you, and that, and then you, from a club level, you could play at the county level would be say in Canada, it would be say playing for your province. Uh, and then there is that, yeah, the county final, which is what you're talking about, the all Ireland final for hurling um, and uh, ladies football and Gaelic football all played in Croke Park. But yeah, it is some sort of atmosphere to be there and, and uh, see it on the day. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's always really exciting games. I mean, one of the most unique aspects of uh, the GAA is its amateur status. Uh, so we have, you, you go into Croke Park, 80,000, as I say, 80,000 spectators, um, playing at an incredibly high level, you know, training as hard as professional athletes, but still all amateur status. So they may win the, the Sam McGuire cup in, in uh, Gaelic football on Sunday. Well, they may take Monday off, but by Tuesday, they're back at work. Uh, you know, whether you're an accountant or a carpenter or a nurse, you know, whatever you do, um, you you still have your day job. And um, so that's one really, really unique aspect of it. And uh, so it's very grassroots. And and so the, you know, obviously, if you're selling tickets, 80,000 tickets, the GAA is always uh, reinvesting uh, the revenues that come from these these events uh, back into the community. And so you'll see across Ireland amazing facilities and clubhouses and so much of it um, gets funding because all of these revenues are reinvested in the community. And so uh, it, it is completely unique in the world in terms of sort of it's you're, you're playing at this incredibly high level. Um, the, the athletes are, you know, as, as fit and strong and working as hard as a professional athlete, but yet um, doing it on an amateur status. And, you know, you mentioned about rural or urban and and playing for your club. And so there's lots of people that say you, you know, grow up in uh, an, a, a, a town or a village, you know, an hour and a half from Dublin, they may now live or work in Dublin, but they're traveling back two or three times a week to play with their club, to play with their county. Um, they're that committed. It, it, it really is um, very, very unique from that perspective. And there have been a few occasions uh, in recent years where there have been exhibitions on this side of the water uh, in places where there are large Irish communities, New York, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll continue to see that. Yeah, you you would see, you know, hurling match in Fenway Park in Boston. And, um, you know, and it does bring this exposure. I mean, obviously, there are very uh, high population of Irish or Irish heritage in, in Boston and New York in those areas. Uh, even in Toronto, back in the early 90s, we had uh, a hurling match held in the Sky Dome. And it was sort of the first time that it had been held in this massive, you know, indoor stadium. Well, with the, the roof closed type of thing. And uh, so, yeah, it's exciting to see. And it's um, there's a real uh, we get a lot of support from the Irish government and the Department of Foreign Affairs. And they work very closely with the GAA because um, it is I, I would characterize it as one of Ireland's best exports. Um, it, it really is. It's a sport because it is the support, the sport that you start for, but it's the community and the involvement um, that you stay for. And so it is a, a really important um, cultural export for Ireland. Are there any cases of some of the stars of the game today coming over, moving to Canada, for instance, playing for Canadian teams uh, and vice versa? Are there any uh, players from Canadian teams who are going back to the old country and uh, excelling and becoming stars there? I mean, certainly you would you have uh, the, the um, immigration and whether that's for a one year, two year work visa or staying permanently. Um, we have, you know, quite a number of our members come from Ireland and and play here. And, and Vancouver particularly is growing um, at, at an incredible rate. Uh, there's just I think it's sort of like it's the hot spot. So people are have friends there and they're and they also have, you know, a great uh, divisional committee that is running, uh, you know, very effective and, and efficiently running games and good governance. And 
um, and really growing, uh, growing that way. So I'd say we, you know, primarily it's, it would be Irish people coming and playing here and finding a home and a club wherever they settle. Um, not as much would we have Canadians growing up one, uh, sorry, uh, going over to Ireland playing one exception would be Paul Lochnan in Toronto, who, um, you know, was born in Canada to Irish parents, um, but, uh, you know, played at a very high level in Toronto. And then in fact, went back to Ireland and played, uh, with, uh, a, a club in Cork and uh, was able to win a medal with them. So I'd say Paul is, is one of the exceptions going that way. But what we do have in terms of sort of giving opportunities for Canadians is the World Games. And that's an incredible tournament where um, last year it was held in Derry and we had over uh, 100 teams from around the world playing there. And Canada had probably a hundred over 100 um, players between the men's and women's and all, all four codes playing and then that's that's just an incredible opportunity especially for people that you know we had a lot of people from quebec so they're you know fully french speaking team going over and and a lot of people that have played these sports for one year five year or ten years but had never actually seen um or had the experience of playing these games over in ireland and so that's uh, an incredible opportunity and that's held every uh three years now that um there was 2016 2019 and and last year and uh, coming up later this year, Labor Day weekend in Burnaby, B.C., uh, where the mayor is Mike Hurley, who's from Northern Ireland himself, the yes. Canadian National Championships. Uh, what can people expect when that comes to Burnaby and Labor Day weekend? Yeah, we're very excited to um, having that to have that being hosted in Burnaby. There's a beautiful location out there, Burnaby Lakes, and uh, so we're expecting probably um, close to a thousand participants. So we're going to have teams from across Canada uh, descending on the Labor Day Labor Day long weekend into into Burnaby and uh, have a full weekend Saturday and Sunday full of games uh of um of all so we probably have maybe 600 or to 700 traveling and then the rest will be made up of the the teams and clubs in vancouver and uh, so it'll be a real celebration of you know irish sport but also irish culture that weekend so we'll you know we look forward to inviting the local community out to come you know take uh, you know be able to view these sports and and some we have like some top level players um and we have you know all sorts of you know senior players and people that are fairly new to the game but you you know you're going to see some of the best um of these irish sports being played uh, in burnaby over that weekend and, and where is there uh, online the, the, the canadian website where people can uh, learn more about the sports and uh, perhaps even uh, find a local club to see if they can try their hand at the sport yeah, so um, Canada GA is the is our uh, name of our organization, and if you go to Gaelic Games Canada. Dot com. So it's GaelicGamesCanada.com. Uh, that's where you can find all information about our sports, but also find in the club section. Yeah, uh, you can search and see. Um, if, if there's a club in in the uh, city or town that you're settling in and then we'll also through all of the social media so canada ga would be the handle on uh facebook and instagram and uh, follow along and all of the information about the canadian national championships which we're calling the cncs um, that'll also be found on our social media and on there'll be a section on our gaelic games canada website that'll have uh, all that information so we yeah invite people to take a look well, thanks again for joining me on the podcast, uh, Carrie Mortimer, who's uh, joining me from Australia, but normally based in Ottawa. She's the county chair of Gaelic Games Canada. And, uh, well, happy St. Patrick's Day. Thanks, Bob. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you, too. podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, convenience store sales over 400 billion new Taiwan dollars last year. Taiwan boasted over 13,000 convenience stores in 2023, government report says. The revenue equals about 17 billion Canadian dollars. Convenience stores have become an integral part of people's lives in Taiwan since they offer everyday products and 24-hour service. Coupled with advertising campaigns and convenience, these factors have led to high sales, the government department said. Beverages, tobacco, and alcohol accounted for about 60% of sales. In Kyoto News, Nissan, Honda begin EV tie-up talks amid competition from Tesla, BYD. 
The Japanese automakers are considering collaborating on EV components, including electric drive systems, and the development of software, as well as complementing their respective product lineups, they said. In the Hong Kong Free Press, new security law would not impact confidentiality of confession, Hong Kong Catholic Diocese says. Concerns have been raised that the confidentiality of spiritual counsel may be compromised under the proposed enactment of legislation under Article 23 of the Basic Law. Article 23 of the Basic Law stipulates that the government shall enact laws on its own to prohibit acts of treason, secession, sedition, and subversion against Beijing. That's around the rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In Coin TV, Columbia CEO Tim Boyle sounds off. If we can't pick up trash, what the hell can we do? Boyle said the lasting image of Portland as an open drug haven will be tough to shake, and the local business climate remains challenging. The Portland Metro Chamber said last year's metro area job growth was a sluggish 1.3% well below the U.S. average. In the Seattle Times, Trump clinches GOP nomination with Washington presidential primary. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump easily won Washington's low-drama presidential primary on March 12th, cementing a November general election rematch. Biden received 85% support in the Democratic primary, while Trump won about 75% of the Republican primary vote. Nikki Haley got 20%. The uncommitted, A pro-Palestinian vote against Biden received 9% support. In The Times Colonist, Victoria councillors vote themselves a 25% raise. The raise, which will take effect in May, will see councillor salaries increase to $65,525 from the current $52,420. The mayor's salary will remain at $131,050 this year. The motion to bump up councillors' salaries was not on the agenda for Thursday's meeting, but was brought forward by Councillor Jeremy Caradona after a consultant's report suggested remuneration for Victoria's council was falling behind those in other Canadian cities. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Virtual Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to Brendan Flynn of the Ireland Canada Place Society, the driving force behind the Ireland Canada Monument, to be built in Vancouver's George Wainborn Park. Flynn's dream since 2005 has been to create a permanent tribute to the Irish who helped build Canada, including a Coquitlam Sawmill executive, New York-born Henry James Mackin, the son of Joseph Patrick Mackin and Catherine Byrne of Drota, Ireland. More information at IrelandCanadaPlace.com. You can nominate someone for a virtual Dynamo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, Custom Homes and Renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of March 17th, 2024. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 17th of March in 1992, almost 69% of referendum voters wanted South Africa's government to end apartheid. Now you know. Send me your feedback, send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the free email newsletter and get updates to your inbox, or follow The Breaker News on X, formerly Twitter, as news happens. And you can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to patreon.com slash thebreakernews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash thebreakernews. (laughs) 